Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. If you would, take your Bibles and open them to John chapter 1, verse 19. That's where we'll start with our study here in just a couple of minutes. We have four of us here today. Uh, Paul is unable to be with us today. He's still under the weather, but he is getting better. And I haven't heard from Bob about if he's going to be able to join us today. But for right now, it's just the four of us and you. We'd like to thank you. thank you so much for joining us. Hey, if you have any questions or comments, you can drop them in the uh, comment area. If you're watching this live stream on Facebook, if you're watching it on YouTube, then use the chat area there. Or you can even email us. You can send us your questions and comments at questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually there also. I would like to remind everyone, if you haven't done so, if you're on the YouTube side of the camp, then be sure to uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel. That way you'll receive notifications um, whenever we go live. This channel is not monetized. Um, it's just us for studying and all 116 subscribers and everything. And on the Facebook side of thing, there you can uh, like and follow. And that way you'll receive notifications over there. Alrighty, well enough of that. Let's go ahead and jump right into our study. We're picking up with John chapter 1 verse 19. Having covered the preceding section over the last two weeks, we now enter into John's record of John the Baptizer. Um, Brian, when, when I look at this a little bit, John's record of John's work, <laughs> John the Baptizer's work, is a little bit different. Just a little bit, you know, than the, the, the synoptic gospels there. Um, you have any over, overview thoughts you want to share before we read this? Well, that's a great observation, uh, John, that it is different, um, partly because one of the things John is going to emphasize, the gospel of John is going to emphasize, is the testimonies of certain people. And John the Baptist's testimony is going to be the central focus. And uh, so, so what's kind of neat about that is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke want you to know that John is the preceding, the prophesied preceding voice that came and baptized people to direct them to repentance. John's going to tell us that the baptism of John also served the purpose of being a testimony in and of itself of the identity of Jesus. So that's going to be a big difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that we find out there was another very personal purpose to the baptism of John that Matthew, Mark, and Luke aren't going to mention, um, and that is, as we're going to find out, that we're that it was used to identify who the Messiah was and that revelation. Um, we're going to get a little more uh, about John as well. We're not going to we're not going to hear about John's death, but we're going to we're going to see in John chapter three, John the Baptist kind of elaborating on his role versus Jesus's role, and and it's just kind of again going to be an interesting thing that we'll see. Okay. All right. Good overview. Good explanation. Um, let's go ahead and start the reading then with this picking up in John chapter one, verse 19. And let's see, we're going to, we're going to, I want to break this up a little bit in our reading here. So let's start verse number 19 and let's go down to verse 23. I think it'd be a good little break point. Um, so Brian, if you would, let's go ahead and read that. Yeah, and I'll be reading from the New King James today, John chapter 1, verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Okay. <clears throat> so, Brian, when we go back to the start of this, and he introduces this the, as the, being the testimony of the John and of John, and as you've already talked about his conversation there with the priests and the Levites who were sent, um, it is interesting, at least in John's record, I find it interesting that he right off the bat, when they said, who are you? He says, I am not the Christ. Okay. What does Christ mean? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So the word Christ uh, is, uh, the Hebrew word is Messiah or Messach, and Christ, uh, the word means anointed one. Yep. Um, that's a very loaded word because sometimes we might just say it's the chosen one in a generic sense. Uh, we know that in the Old Testament, there were three offices that were anointed offices. We know that the high priest was an anointed office. We know that the king was an anointed office. And we have an occasion where we find even a prophet was an anointed office. So the Christ could fit into the idea of a prophet, a priest, or a king. David is called the Christ. Uh, you know, even uh, Aaron has that idea, too. So there, the word Christ is a very important word. It's not a name. It's a title. Uh, and it's a description of somebody who, and, and as I said, the most generic way, is somebody who has been chosen. Um, specifically, the people are looking for a chosen one, a Messiah, who was going to deliver them. And that's the question that they're asking about here. Not, not a very specific one, but a very generic question about the identity of the Messiah. Okay. All righty. Well, let's expand this a little bit then. Get rid of Brian's lower third there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to throw this next one, kind of looking at this to Brendan. So they asked him, are you Elijah? And we, we can kind of understand that because there is, in a sense, prophetically, a reference to Elijah who was to come. All right. But what, what I want to come back to that for just a minute. That's kind of secondary, although they ask it first. They ask him, are you the prophet? Mm hmm who, who are they, who do you think they're referencing here? So uh, first century Judaism and to some degree Judaism today, um, and this is gonna help us answer, I think some questions later about John's answers to these questions, John the baptizer's answers to these questions, is that some Jews were not looking for a single Messiah. They actually were looking for two or three um, and one of them was referred to as the prophet. Now, the capital T, uh, my understanding is this refers back to Deuteronomy in the 18th chapter in verse 15. And this is from the Legacy Standard Version, but it reads, uh, this is what Moses is saying to the people in, in the context here about the test of who to tell who is and who is not a true prophet God. Moses speaks prophetically here. And he says, Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. You shall listen to him. Now, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, gets used elsewhere in the New Testament. Acts uses it a couple times in the apostolic preaching of the Christ. But the idea is the Messiah was going to be somebody like Moses. Well, what? how is he going to be like Moses? Well, let's think about Moses for a minute. Moses is a mediator between man and God. We see him doing that several times in the book of Exodus. Moses is a law giver. He is the chosen person by which God makes known his will. We call it the law of Moses for a reason. Uh, Moses served as priest. Uh, before Aaron and his brothers entered the priesthood, it's Moses offering the sacrifices um, and making intercession for the people. Um, it's it, it's um, you know, those, those several things. Now, Jesus has not been introduced yet in John's gospel, but immediately we can start seeing the parallels. Jesus is a law giver. He is the chosen uh, instrument by which God makes known his will. Jesus is an intercessor. He makes atonement for the people's sins. He acts as priest in that. The book of Hebrews deals with that. And if, well, I know it's not Matthew's gospel, but to me it's always been interesting when you read Matthew's gospel, when Jesus gives a sermon on the mount, which is considered the core of all Christian teaching, it, the new law, if you will, uh, there's some parallels there. It's after he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, uh, and he comes up on a mountain to give the law. Well, Israel is in the wilderness. Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the law. There's parallels there because Matthew's gospel is written to the Jews, and I think God's intentionally there showing like, okay, if you didn't get the explicit statements, here's some implicit stuff here that shows Jesus as that type of prophet like Moses. So those are my thoughts there on that, John. All right. Appreciate that. It's a good point. Any any additions to that uh, from Tom or Brian? You know, just real quick, tying this mm -hmm. all together, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you're going to talk about Elijah in a moment or not, but, but, you know, you've got to mention I'm not the Christ, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. 
you know, one of the things that I just kind of thought about is, isn't it, isn't it interesting how with John, whatever he's preaching and stuff, he got enough attention to cause them to ask this question. That, that, that within itself tells you that there was something different about the way that John was preaching and and uh, what he was doing. I mean, uh, people took note of him until, uh, quite honestly, just like Jesus, uh, he wasn't what they wanted. Okay. We're going to talk about Elijah, though, in just a second. Yeah. I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. Before we do that, I've noticed a couple others have joined us for our study, uh, Danielle and Marcia. Good to have you with us here for our study today. Chris Kramer, uh, Truth and Reasons with us, Eileen and Jerry, and there may be others. Um, if you want to pop in and, and leave us a question or a comment, says, hi, look at me, I'm in Serbia. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Just say hi. <laughs> we would, uh, we'll say hi back to you, at least try to. Um, but if you do have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to, to let them, you know, tell us, share them with us through the comment section and the chat section. We would definitely like to hear from you. So let's talk about Elijah j just briefly here. Um, so Brian, you, you mentioned this earlier, kind of before we started the study there. Why why is it odd that they would ask him, a, that he would say that he's not Elijah? So there's a prophecy in Malachi that, uh, that with the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah, it would be preceded by this one that would be the messenger. And then it says in uh, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So there's looking for a type of return of Elijah. And we're going to be told in Matthew chapter, uh, let me just pull this up and double check out where I give the verse. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17, we're going to be told that Elijah was coming first. And that in verse 13, it says that he, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. So what I think is kind of interesting is the return of Elijah that Malachi prophesied was fulfilled by John the Baptist. Jesus says so. So it's kind of interesting that when they say, are you Elijah? John says no. When Jesus later says, well, he kind of was. And I'll throw my thought out there, and I'm curious to hear what everybody else thinks. I suspect what the idea is, is they're asking, are you literally Elijah? Now, remember, Elijah, of course, didn't die. He was taken away. So maybe he's come back. Are you are you him? Well, John's not literally Elijah, but he is the one who has come in the form of Elijah. Now, uh, but just as a side note, what's really neat is that we have this prophecy that Elijah would come. We have this prophecy that one like Moses would come. Then at the Mount of Transfiguration, we have Moses and Elijah literally coming and uh, appearing to Jesus. So that little side note, too, is going to be in play later. Right now, though, we're just talking about those that come in the former fashion. And by the way, we have a third prophecy about David coming back and being the prince again. Um, well, that's, you know, Moses, David, Melchizedek. You know, these are the prophet and priest and king that are actually all fulfilled in Jesus. So a little confusing there what John is saying. And like I said, I'd be curious if anybody has a different thought on that. Uh, to me, it seems like the most likely is they think he's literally Elijah and he's saying he's not. That seems reasonable. My, my, thoughts thoughts? Would, my, my thoughts would just be more a, a more subtle take on, on, on what Brian had said. I, I think it goes back to the purpose of each gospel. You look at the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What's their purpose? Their purpose is to show Jesus is the Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy. And what you see, uh, what you see in Matthew and Mark and Luke is, especially Matthew, Matthew's big emphasis is like, here's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So it doesn't it make sense to me why you would have an explicit statement recorded in Matthew's gospel by Jesus said, hey, John the Baptist is Elisha. John's gospel is a different read all on its own. Now, we were you guys, I'm sure, did this in the introduction, but you look at the end of John's gospel. He, he's right that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, but John's gospel is much, much more thematically structured than the others. It's groups of sevens. And I, to me, I think the answer in John's gospel is, is found in verse 19. Is these are, they didn't come of their own curiosity, these Levites from Jerusalem. They were sent. Mm -hmm. They were sent. Now, from the other gospel accounts, we can gather a lot of reasons, maybe why we can infer they were sent. Uh, we find that the Sanhedrin at this time is very paranoid of any 
sort of uh, alternative claim to be a messiah or a teacher. They don't like threats to their power. Uh, secondly, based on some extra biblical writings around this time and before this, that we understand that there was this apocalyptic mindset of this anticipation of a literal Elijah who was going to come back in that fiery chariot and, and help deliver the people. Um, and so uh, the reason I say it's more subtle, it's a subtle take on, on, on Brian's is I think John here, when he says, I am not Elijah, is I'm not your picture of Elijah. I'm not a political leader. I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not here to deliver you. I'm here to make way the make way the uh, the way of the Lord. I'm here to prepare that way. Um, but again, John, he's going to get himself in trouble later, not because of any wrongdoing, but simply speaking truth to Herod. But you know, now's not the time. His his mission here is to preach the the repentance leading to salvation in the Christ. Um, it's not here to stir up strife or start a rebellion or a revolution. So those are my longer thoughts there. <laughs> well, I think it's a good explanation. It's definitely a, a good way of looking at it. So then let's come down to verse uh, number 23. So they say, well... Hey, John, just... Can no, I say ahead, Tom. A couple of real yeah. quick... Sure, thoughts. go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, John realized... One thing to understand, John realized who he was. Um, I mean, I, he realized his purpose, as we're going to see here in a moment. The other other point that I think is worthy of consideration, and when you look at the four Gospels, uh, I'm of the belief that John was the last Gospel, you know, the, the fourth. And, and I see it as somewhat of a supplement to the others. In other words, the others were being circulated, and people were aware of what was in the others. And I think that John, in many cases, answers questions that people had that they might have read or heard about based on the other Gospels. So he gives he gives additional information, and you have that as the example here. You know, I, I'm not the Messiah. You know, and I like the way Brandon pointed that out, but then he goes on, you know, uh, you know I'm not Elijah. Even though Jesus had clarified, for, for lack of a better sake, he is Elijah. You know, he, he's, he's the fulfilled prophecy of Malachi. And, and uh, John goes on to explain that a little bit and and so he develops it you know so anyways that's my thoughts on that so and one little side point that i forgot to mention i think this section here and, and but what brian brought in matthew 17 really gives us a lesson on how to understand biblical prophecy uh but so many times we're it, it, it's almost like a, a um we tend to think of prophecy as like fitting, you know, fitting the, the different shaped pegs in their appropriate holes. It has to fit exactly in everything else. When oftentimes what you find fulfillment of biblical prophecy sometimes is in the spirit of the prophecy, not in the literal one to one. Yeah. Sometimes prophecy has multiple fulfillments. Um, there's the immediate fulfillment for Israel or David or whoever it's talking about, but also there's a later fulfillment. And, and so, you know, I think this is give us a, a lesson here that okay yeah john the baptist fulfilled that prophecy elijah was going to come but we find out that oh that prophecy was not about elijah literally coming it was about what what did elijah do in his lifetime it was a time of immense godliness he returned the people of israel back to their god through that great display of, of god's power in mount carmel he was faithful in a in a in an unfaithful generation so What's John? We see the same thing with John the Baptist doing. How many dozens and hundreds of people were restored back to a faith in God to the preaching of John the Baptist? And how many people did John prepare to receive the preaching of the Christ? You know, he did exactly what Elijah did. Yeah, that's it. That's a good point. Good explanation. Yeah. Um, if you have any thoughts at home, we'd love to hear from you. You can drop into the chat area that's connected with this live stream on Facebook or the comment the other way around, comment in Facebook chat area in YouTube. And uh, you can even send us questions or comments via email. I may not be able to check them during our study, but you can send them and we can bring them in next week. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually if there's something you need to touch base with us individually uh, regarding so let's see, continuing forward now, verse number 23. So they, they, they say, what do you say about yourself? So John then pulls from Isaiah chapter uh, 40 there in verse three, 
where he says, um, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And so John himself, uh, John the baptizer identifies that he is the subject of the prophecy, the one whom Jesus, who the Lord, the Holy Spirit through the prophet said was going to come. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, his message was make straight the way of the Lord. And that was, of course, the one Isaiah has one that made the statement. And he helps us with that by, by saying that. But I think there's a very powerful idea behind this phrase, make straight the way of the Lord. One of the things that we've talked about before, um, guys, is the fact that John's message, John the baptizer's message, was to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But we know that it was something very serious because he said to the Pharisees in, in the other accounts, you know, when they've come out to, see, to learn to see who he was, he says, you brood of vipers, who has warned you of the wrath that is to come? You know, so the establishment of the kingdom, what it was to come, was going to be something that was very great. And so he came to prepare the way, make straight the way of the Lord, um, as Isaiah said he would. Um, any thoughts about that, though, before we, um, there's something in verse 25 I want us to talk about here in a second. But any thoughts about making straight the way of the Lord? Brendan. Mm -hmm. um, not really on the verse itself, but just mm -hmm. how John's writings, what John often does. We're, we're studying the general epistles of John right now, Wednesday nights, and John would rather reaffirm truth and show us what is true rather than explicitly call out what's wrong and refute in detail what's wrong. So, you know, John's writing at the end of first century, there's a whole bunch of false ideas about the Christ. He didn't, he didn't actually come in, in bodily form. He wasn't actually raised, all this kind of stuff. John doesn't care about that. He goes back in the general epistles like, okay, here are the facts of the incarnation. Here are the facts of the resurrection. I think you're seeing something similar here with, you know, Elijah. There was, there was still, and there still is to this day, a lot of ideas about, you know, Elijah and what he's going to do and everything else. And, well, John would rather show us, here's truth about Elijah and the coming of Elijah and John the Baptist. And I, and to our last question, um, I think this just supports the answers that we gave. This says, okay, he says he's not Elijah, and yet then he quotes prophecy about Elijah. Mm -hmm. So that may seem that, okay, is he contradicting himself? No, he's, he's rejecting their understanding of Elijah yeah. and affirming the biblical understanding of who Elijah is going to be. Yeah. Um, but one little thing here, you know, on the verse itself since you asked that um you know we see this throughout human history even with israel's history but there comes there's times where there's been departures and the way of the lord if we might use that as a stand-in for true worship and devotion gets distorted gets crooked um and oftentimes it takes uh periods of great reformation or restoration depending on your era uh, to restore or bring back people to the straight and narrow. Um, you saw that several times, the reign of Hezekiah, the reign of Josiah, those are great periods of straightening the way of the Lord. Uh, in secular history, the great awakenings in this country, there was a great return back to what the Bible said. Um, and then there's been periods throughout our country's history where people have gone back to, let's, let's get with what it says. Yeah. Um, and so you see that, John the Baptist is initiating a new period of this. Uh, let's get back to what God said. Let's get back to the right way. Let's get back to what God actually wants us to be doing. Well, they've had what I'm going to, I'm going to estimate high 500 years of compiling their own thoughts and ideas and traditions regarding these things. And he's like, what you he's, let's just go back to what was written. Yeah. All right. So with that said, Verse number 25. Let me pop it back up on the screen here real quick. So we know what John was doing. John was, was uh, baptizing uh, unto repentance, or uh, baptizing, what is it, for unto repentance and remission of sins. So they, they saw this about him. And John records something very interesting. He says, and they asked him saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Now, I don't want to you know, draw our study out in too fine of detail for too long, but I thought that statement there was really interesting. The idea of 
they were asked, then why do you baptize? Why do you immerse if you are not the Christ or Elijah nor the prophet? Um, what was it about baptism, about immersion, that they would have seen and understood a particular or use to that washing? Any thoughts about that? Because it was something so, they, they uh, seemed to have thought the Messiah would do when he came. Sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. There was something called the mikvah, uh, which okay. was a ceremonial washing. Um, typically, what's kind of interesting is it was when a woman got married, she went to the mikvah, and she was ritually cleansed. And that's probably what uh, Ephesians is kind of playing off of in Ephesians 5 when it talks about Jesus, uh, the, the bride of Christ being washed uh, with water is kind of this idea of a purification process. So they did have some kind of tradition. Some people kind of, uh, it, it only pops up about 100 years before Jesus and it's kind of, some people kind of tie it back to the priests washing themselves. Some people think maybe they were totally immersed. So that's that's all the information I would have about what was going on with baptism beforehand. Um, maybe maybe some of the other guys have a better answer, though. You know, uh, and, uh, and again, this is enigmatic, if you will. But But obviously, by the way they're asking this, they see that, there's authority attached with the idea of baptism that that it, it and uh, I, I think they see it with authority from God and 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 and, I, and I'd go back to you mentioned about the priesthood there Brian and, and I'd, I'd go back I'd go back to that the fact that the priests had to wash before they entered uh, and and I'm I've heard things about how the Jews did baptize I don't know I don't know if they baptized proselytes when they were coming in to purify them or or what all they did but 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 obviously they saw significance in the act of baptism they, they saw it as something associated with authority from god and here's john you know just a common guy baptizing people and and and, and they want to know what's your basis for this he wasn't doing it as a levite you know he, he okay. wasn't doing it as a priest uh, uh, he's already said, I'm not Elijah and I'm not the Messiah. Uh, so, well, why are you baptizing? Me? And, uh, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, basically I'm baptizing because God told me to, <laughs> that All that's right. really the bottom line. And, and he goes into that in the explanation. And, Sorry, and it, well, expanding on some of these comments, I agree with what's been said, and I think Tom hits it on the head. You know, he just said, I'm not the Christ, I'm not the prophet, I'm not Elijah. And the Jews, by their question, understood that it would be appropriate for one of those three guys to be doing that, but John's near that, so I think it is a question of authority. What I find more significant about John's baptism mm -hmm. um, is, as Brian pointed out, there was the mikvah uh, for the wedding. Uh, there was also something known as proselytes baptism. And this is where a Jewish convert to Judaism would go through a cleansing ritual that they called baptism, mm -hmm. and they would give them a Jewish name. And as far as I can tell in my studies, proselytes were considered fully Jewish, um, at least in the first century. Now, it didn't really happen much in Israel itself. It's more of something you see in the diaspora. Um, but, you know, you have the Ethiopian eunuch who is definitely... But from what we can tell, maybe not of Jewish descent. Maybe he is, you know, the diaspora. Uh, but the first Gentile convert wasn't until Acts 10 with Cornelius. And so, you know, that was a thing. But that was administered to non-native non Jews. John's baptism is being administered to native Jews. So it's different from the mikvah and the other cleansing ceremony that they were associated with. And the purpose is much different than either one of those. John, the Bible says explicitly, his baptism is unto repentance for the remission of sins. Of sins yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it, it's it's a <clears throat> foreshadow of what's to come. But what's more importantly about John's baptism, and I think part of the reason why John kind of, not maybe, maybe not deflects, but John's baptism was not an end of itself. It, it, it was preparatory it was to prepare it was to point people to the christ um and you see that we're going to see that in just a minute when jesus comes to receive baptism uh that kind of if there was any doubt that that was from god i think jesus accepting that and being baptized shows that it is from god uh so anyway um 
so yeah but basically tom and brian's answer is the same it's like it's a different baptism they're wondering where where do you have the authority for this and you know john being the enigmatic prophet doesn't really give a direct answer but from other gospel accounts we can kind of get that answer there so okay yeah the there was a book i had i've loaned it out to someone uh basically archaeology showing you know through um how we came to i can't remember what it was called anyway the fellow had pictures of um, arche uh, um archaeological finds jewish homes and it looked like some of the jewish homes had what we would call maybe baptismal pools where they'd go down to the stairs and they would be ceremon basically ceremonially cleansed for going to the temple type thing there but what's interesting though and the pulpit commentary kind of kind of brought this to light then it may not be related to this but in foretelling what was to come Ezekiel 36, 25 says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of a stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Um, and, and so the point is, I think, and you've already, you've already touched on this, is what the Messiah was going to do. There's going to be a cleansing that takes place. Okay. There's going to be a consecration that will have to take place. And this, to connect this with repentance and to the remission of sins. All right, this is going to be a ceremonial, uh, this is not a ceremony, this will be a cleansing that must take place. The Hebrew writer um, talks about our hearts being sprinkled from an evil conscience, I believe it is. And so I just thought it was interesting that, going back to what you were saying, they were expecting the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet to, to, to go to bring the people and bring in them where they needed to be, to go through this cleansing process, the spiritual cleansing process, maybe even, uh, seen within a physical aspect of it. But as you were already pointed out, the purpose behind John's baptism wasn't simply, it wasn't to cleanse them of all their sins. It was unto the remission of sins, but ultimately to prepare them for the coming of the Christ. And Brendan, I love the point that you made. People talk about why was Jesus baptized by Sean, by John? Well, to fulfill all righteousness, but the explanation you gave was a really good one to show people that the baptism was from God. Yeah. Part of the preparing the way. Yeah. Um, let me look at the comments real quick. I looked down and my screen has changed. So we've got some thoughts there on this. Um, see, I'll talk about the, the Duras, the Duraspus. Um, the diaspora. Mc yeah, diaspora. That's it. Yeah, I said it wrong. Um, Aline makes an interesting comment in regards to John was a descendant of Aaron and the son of a high priest. He, well, he was. That's right. Yeah, Zacharias there in the temple. Very good point. And um, Brian clarifies the diaspora refers to the scattered Jews around the world. Um, it's, it, would, would you connect that with Peter's to the pilgrims of the dispersion? Or is that a little bit different, you think? It's the same idea. Um, yeah. I think he's referring to a different group of people, but it was a, it's what the Jews refer to their scattering away from the homeland after the captivity, mm -hmm. but not all the Jews returned. And yeah. this is where we get why there's synagogues throughout the Mediterranean world when Paul goes preaching. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a concept very familiar. And so I think when the later epistles use that, it's referring to the dispersion of Christians now because of the same similar situations, persecution. Yeah. Um, so you know, um, that's one of the things in writer uh, that was an idea the Jews had in the first century, and some still have today, that uh, one day the diaspora will come to an end and all the Jews will be gathered back. And funny enough, you, you kind of see uh, that in spirit happening, Acts 2, when all the nations are gathered to hear the gospel and, and so forth. Yeah. But we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit in time there. But <laughs> anyway. Um, any final thoughts before we kind of go into the next section? Where, I mean, verse 26 is really clear. I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Um, he is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He basically tells them he's already here. He's walking amongst you right now. Um, thought that was interesting. Any, any thoughts, though, um, up to verse number... Did we not read this section? Well, okay, I guess we did walk him through it. <laughs> yeah, you read through verse 23 initially. Verse 23 is where we read yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, well, we've done, read it through 
<laughs> referencing it, I guess. But like, actually, let's do read that real quick. Um, Brendan, go ahead and read this last section, 24 down through 28. And if there's any other thoughts, we'll do that and then move on into the next section there. Okay. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 24 from the New King James Version, and it reads as follows. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in uh, Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Okay. Any thoughts or comments on this last section here? Well, one thought immediately came to my mind that uh, verse 24 helps explain who the people were in verse 19, because it refers to those who were sent were of the Pharisees. And so, again, this is a sect that Jesus lashes heads with quite a bit. He does with this lesser degree the Sadducees, but the Pharisees were the majority at this point. And so we just get more information of who these people are coming out to question and inquire and, and kind of probe the ministry of John the Baptist here. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and also another thought that comes to my mind in that verse of 27, um, John has an idea of who Jesus is. Uh, I mean, and, and you know, I, I've often, you often wonder about this. We, we don't read anything about his upbringing with the exception of at age 12, you know, but, but I, I, I lean toward when I, I, I don't lean toward, I, I, Jesus lived a perfect life the whole time. It wasn't just after he was baptized. You know, I, I, I'm, I mean, it, it's indicated that he was perfectly sinless and so on. And John understands who Jesus is. Uh, uh, he's the Messiah. Uh, he's the, the, he's the Son of God, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and that's uh, uh, it's interesting. I know uh, Brendan made the point earlier that John's enig enigmatic with his answer. I mean, yeah, he does not give the <laughs> he doesn't answer it directly. Uh, uh, but he, I tell you, what, it, it 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 really doesn't matter for me other than it's by authority. You, yeah. you need to be you need to be looking for the Christ. Because uh, that's who you're looking for, and, and and he is coming. Matter of fact, he's already here, and uh, uh, and I'm not even worthy to do anything for him. And of course, that leads us, that leads us into the baptism of Jesus, as recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Which is interesting when you come to verse 29, which we're going to read here in a minute. We go beyond that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and and to that point, just so often, and I, I make this point that. Sometimes what's a frustration frustration for new converts and people is, well, why doesn't the Bible just explicitly state it out? And my answer has always been the same. It's because God respects your intelligence. Um, God will rather show you something than spoon feed you, okay? Now, are there some people who need that spelled out? Yes, and that's why we have each other and, and so forth. But so many times, especially Old Testament, Old Testament narrative would rather show you what's wrong or what's right and let you draw the conclusion than explicitly stated. Um, here, there should be no question who this Jesus of Nazareth is after the baptism. I mean, there there should be no question whatsoever, because it's clearly shown through John, uh, the writing here. That's a good point. And did you notice what's missing from verse 26? I say that very carefully, a little bit of tongue in cheek. But let me bring up here a little bit. John says, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. What's missing there? And I don't mean really missing, missing, like it's been taken out of the text. But compared to the other Gospels, the other Gospels have John saying something else that in this particular point, he doesn't say. Yeah, John said, I'm not worthy to be baptized by you. Uh, I mean, no, uh, no, I, no, uh, no, no, that's not it. Okay, I baptize well, with water, but the one who yeah. comes after me will baptize you with Holy Spirit. Spirit fire. Yeah. Holy <laughs> Sorry. Spirit fire. Yeah. Good point. I just thought it was interesting that, you know, he, he will, the, the direction he's going will eventually get to, yeah. all right, but he's only here to baptize with water. What Jesus was going to do, the one that followed him was far greater. All right. Any thoughts? 
<laughs> okay, let's see. All right, I didn't warn y'all ahead of time. I was going to ask that question. Yeah. I don't Brian, always warn them. Sometimes point. I do, but. Yeah. Well, I have a point, but it might be something that ought to wait till uh, the next moment because we talked about how does John know Jesus, and and John, maybe you want us to read a little further before we talk about that. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Let's go ahead and um, Tom, if you would read for us. Let's go ahead and start with verse twenty nine. We need to read the context or the whole section. So we'll go down to verse number 24, if you would, sir. Oh, uh, uh, tw uh, 20, 29 to 24? Okay. 34. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. All right. Okay. Uh, 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 John 1, 29. Uh, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. He remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Okay. All right. So with that read, Brian, what were your thoughts? Just go ahead. Well, I wanted to talk about a little bit about this idea of John saying twice there, I didn't know him. Mm -hmm. um, because that seems a little bit odd when we look at the other accounts of Jesus' baptism. And what's neat about this one, by the way, is this is an after-the-fact account. This is a retelling of what happened, whereas Matthew, Mark, Luke tell you as it's happening what's going on. Um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when Jesus shows up, John knows who he is because John says, I don't need to baptize you. And I think that goes to what Tom said earlier, that Jesus is has lived such a life up until this age, uh, Luke tells us 30 years old. Um, so that puts John is about 30 years old. Um, that up until this time, Jesus has probably lived such a life that when he shows up to be baptized, John says, well, you don't need this. People that need to repent need this. That's the thing. Um, I think what John is saying here is that he knows Jesus personally. They're related. We know they are somehow, you know, their mothers are related. And so we know they're related. I, I see my mother brings up the comment, uh, my favorite commenter by the way, in our Truth Factor Forum. Um, she brings up the comment that uh, it, when when Jesus and John are first come together, John leaps in the womb, that that's the, the first time they meet. Uh, does John remember that? I don't know. But John knows who Jesus is personally, but John does not know who the Messiah is officially. He's not given that information. Instead, he's given a test that you're going to baptize people and one day you're going to baptize somebody and something's going to happen. And that's him. I was wondering, you know, I always think of John baptizing people. I think, you know, baptize him. Uh, no, it's not this one. Baptize him. Oh, it's not this one. That John is, you know, going through a process that while people are coming to be baptized uh, for, for this repentance to get their life right, John's looking for something else to happen. And John's told, and, and by the way, what's really interesting is that John says here, this is why I came baptizing. Now, Everywhere else it says he came baptizing for the sake of repentance of Israel. But here John says, I'm baptizing to identify the Messiah. I, that's actually why I'm here. And maybe nobody knew that but John. Maybe this is the first time John even says that. Because this is when John jumps out and says, it's him. It's that guy right there. You know, he's the one there in verse 29. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, this idea when the, the big question people always have is, why did Jesus get baptized? You know, because he has no sins to repent of. Uh, he has no, you know, sins that need to be addressed. And Jesus makes that statement to him, you know, permit it for the sake of all righteousness. That's what Jesus is talking about. Now, now Tom said this earlier. Tom said what's neat about the book of John is that it seems to answer questions that you might have from the other three Gospels. One of the big questions is, why does Jesus get baptized? John's telling us here. He gets baptized because this was God's way of revealing the Messiah. It, it, it wasn't about Jesus, you know, needing to have his sins uh, removed or something like that. It was this divine, threefold divine, or twofold with the Father and the Holy Spirit, both at the same time revealing that he was the Messiah, and that's what John is uh, expecting and looking for. So it's a pretty, pretty big thing right here. What we just read is an extraordinarily important point, uh, and also can raise a couple of questions if we're not reading it carefully. 
Yeah, right. you know, and, and and tying into all those points, you know, the way that you add this to the other Gospels that deal with it, because, uh, like I said, he clearly adds to it. Uh, John, uh, obviously John knew who Jesus was, and, and and I'm fully convinced he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. The coming of the Holy Spirit, only John tells us that he knew that ahead of time. And so basically the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a verification it's it's a verification after John has baptized Jesus. And I don't think it was just for John either. I think it was for those who were also there that witnessed him. And uh, uh, and John elaborates on that in John's gospel about what I had seen. You know, I you've got you've got two verses in John's gospel that are the baptism. The rest of it is afterwards. You know, verses 29 and 30 is at the baptism the rest of it he's explaining at some point later on mm -hmm. if that's the way it seems to me one other thought here and um you know i take a slightly different approach to the the johnine corpus or the gospels and stuff i you know i i think it does fill in gaps of the others but at the same time i think it stands alone and knowing the time that john's writing um you had teachers who are claiming special knowledge and that's what you needed to be saved and here here you have a prophet of god who had the spirit since his mother's since his mother's womb right and yet we find that there is a difference in the relation relational knowing of jesus which the other gospels affirm i mean john the baptist is a cousin in the flesh i mean there was some there was some relationship there but john's gospel emphasized john the baptist as witness and the witnesses of Christ's deity. And I think the, 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 the knowing here is dealing with, he hasn't known him yet as, as Messiah to provide witness and in the full sense of that. Does he have a probably a, a, a knowledge that there's something different about this Jesus? Yeah, I mean, he refuses water to be baptized to begin with because he's like, you don't need this. Uh, but I, I think when you see that 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 twofold or threefold confirmation of Christ as Messiah, you know that's when John can really give his full witness to the whole of Jesus up until he knows that point as, as Messiah to provide um, that witness there. So anyway, okay. those are my thoughts. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Uh, what what y'all said is really interesting on this. The question that I was left with, all right, so I'm considering what Brian had said a while ago, and then Tom, I'm still processing the, uh, of if John actually knew Jesus was the Messiah, all right, but that's very well could have been, but so then I'm brought back to the statement when um, Jesus and Brendan, you touched on this, Jesus comes to John and John says, I, I don't need, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And I wonder, okay, if we take the argument for a moment that John did not know yet, because it's, it's not revealed directly until Jesus comes up out of the water, okay, that the Lord, the Spirit descends on him like a dove and the Father speaks from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So let's say for a sake of argument that John was not certain that Jesus was Messiah, then could it be something about the very life that Jesus lived that calls John to say, I don't need to be baptized by you, and, or you don't need to be baptized by me. Instead, I need to be baptized by you. Is that possible? Or is that statement really lending to the fact that John knew that Jesus was Messiah you, without uh, the witness and confirmation? Both. I mean, it, you know, it could definitely be both. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, and I think there can be a little bit of both in it too. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I, I mean, some things that are not said in scripture, you know, <laughs> which leads to our speculations. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> think about this. Mary visits Elizabeth when she's six months pregnant with John. The spirit, John leaps in the belly. Mary knows, or excuse me, Elizabeth knows that Mary is not yet married. And she knows that she's going to have a child of a virgin. Do you suppose that at some point a conversation was made with her son, John, you know, about these spectacular events? 
about John himself. I mean, uh, age, you know, um, Elizabeth is old when John is born. It's a miraculous birth. Do, do you, I, I, I can't help but, and it's speculation, but I can't help but, but think that from time to time, John and Jesus saw each other as they were growing up. Again, that, that there's no proof. There's no proof, but but uh, the fact that Mary, when she hears about John, what does she do? She goes and visits Elizabeth. You know, uh, uh, so I, I see that relationship there, and so I, I it let's just say it wouldn't surprise me. And also, you've got the preaching of John. You, you've got you got the preaching of John as recorded in Matthew and so on, where you know he knows the corruption of the people. And he's obviously preaching as a prophet. And that's the thing to understand. Jesus called him a prophet. There's no prophet greater than John the Baptist. So, so that, that's, why, that's why I have a belief that he knew exactly who Jesus was. You know, uh, and um, the fact is God said, I'm going to verify it when you baptize him or, or I'm going to verify it. You're going to see the spirit descending upon him. Okay. And, uh, and so that's how I tie that all together. And again, I know that's speculation. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, take it with a grain of salt. You know, I was going to say, uh, maybe you can get a cup of coffee with that, but just don't forget the dollar or, or the $5 at McDonald's. You know? <laughs> Brendan, what were you going to say? Yeah, I want to make sure um, I said um, David dropped in the chat room. Um, he said, how did John not know he was Jesus? And, and the distinction that I was making there, and, and I think y'all saw that as well. I believe it's very possible John knew him by faith that he was Jesus, the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, et cetera. You know, and I'm, I agree with Tom. I figure Elizabeth had conversations with John about his cousin, you know, Jesus, or at least that process. But he as knew far, he was special. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, but before the baptism, when John at the baptism, John saw the full confirmation as John has already talked about. Did he have the assurance already that Jesus was the Messiah? And that's the unknown, at least to me, the unknown question. Well, there's yeah. there's a parallel to be made with the Lord's brothers and sisters in the flesh. You yeah. know, they live with them. And that's yet true. John's gospel is gonna tell us that, that his brothers did not believe in him until after the resurrection and so having i'm not trying to dissuade the common or anything it's just but having a association and familiarity with jesus even in the flesh was not a guarantee of of knowledge of his of, of his lordship and his messiahship john's a little bit different he has the holy spirit from his mother's womb but even then he may have indication or inklings or maybe he is the guy he's matching the pictures but we do see john waiting as we see in John's gospel, uh, until the confirmation of the spirit, w whatever knowledge he had beforehand, it's absolutely confirmed with the descending of the spirit and God declaring from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. And so I, I think there's a parallel there. Um, maybe not a one-to-one, -one, but you know, two of the Lord's brothers become pillars in the early church. I mean, they write two of the books of the New Testament, at least in my opinion. I think it's the Lord's half-brother who wrote James and Jude is included in that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's the people, uh, we'll put in pra practical application, sometimes it's the people who take the longest to convert who end up becoming the strongest uh, Christians. You know, not saying that John is in that category, but a little, little side point there. So They, they would have known his name was Jesus. As we call it, Jesus. That's actually Yeshua, mm -hmm. version of Joshua, isn't it? Um, Hebrew Joshua, I guess. But th th they would have known him in anointed one. But to understand why, you know, John, you know, they wouldn't have had the understanding of why is he considered anointed until yeah. much later. And like you said, his siblings knew who he was, but not truly who he was. They did not believe. And and but John, when he saw this at the baptism of Jesus, full assurance, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, matter of fact, we'll get into that in the next section next week. When we pick up there in verse number 35 about John identifying him as the Lamb of God. And so that'll be a very, very good section to look at. 
All righty. I think that's all for our time. It's uh, right at 12.04. Be a good stopping point for this week. Um, we'll plan to continue our study next week in John chapter 1 there in verse 35 and continue um, continue there. Listen, guys, I appreciate all your participation and comments. Um, Brian, you too, even though you got off camera for a second. <laughs> appreciate you. Um, everyone who's been, who's uh, joined us today in chat room, thank you so much for your wonderful comments. If you do have a question or comment that maybe comes up later, be sure to send it to us and the questions at truthfactorlive.com um, or email us individually there. We would uh, love to hear from you. And if possible, if it's a question or a thought pertaining to our current study, we'll try to bring it in. If it's a question maybe it doesn't even pertain to the study, we'll try to make time as well to answer that study. We'd definitely love to hear from you. All right, anything else? Remember to like and subscribe on YouTube and like and follow on Facebook. Got to start plugging that a little bit more there, but you know what to do. You do. But I appreciate it very much. Is that all, gentlemen? Okay. We Thanks, will see everybody, everyone. for your comments. Yeah, appreciate your comments. We'll see everyone again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time, right back here at truthfactorlive.com or Truth Factor Live on our social media platforms. Thank you so much. We'll see everyone next week. Have a wonderful week.